As discussed in previous episodes, Michael Sandel offers three categorizations of approaches to justice. The first categorization emphasizes welfare. We discussed an example of this approach in the last episode by looking at utilitarianism. Sandel's second category emphasizes liberty. In this episode, we're going to focus on one approach within this camp, libertarianism. Do your magic, Carl. Let's start this thing. The first thing we should note about libertarianism is it's actually a pretty broad category. Sandel doesn't quite capture the variety of forms of libertarianism in his chapter, so we'll spend a few moments talking about it here. While all libertarians emphasize the importance of human liberty, some libertarians emphasize this important because they consider liberty a fundamental and inviolable human right, while other libertarians tend to focus on liberty because they think that emphasizing liberty will maximize welfare for the most amount of people. So it's a focus on liberty, but a more consequentialist approach. While all libertarians embrace a very strong notion of private property, libertarians will differ on the extent to which people can claim ownership over natural resources like water. While all libertarians believe that the role of the state or government should be limited, they differ on how limited that role should be. For example, anarcho-capitalists maintain that the state should be eliminated completely. In the United States, one of the more common forms of libertarianism is minimal state libertarianism. In this view, the role of the state is limited to protecting individual liberty by providing a police force, a court system, and a military. There are also liberal libertarians. These libertarians argue that the state does have a role in regulating the acquisition and transfer of natural resources, to ensure a more egalitarian distribution of these resources. In this episode, we're going to focus on minimal state libertarianism because that's the most common form in the United States. Sing it with me, Carl. This form of libertarianism was made most popular by the American philosopher Robert Nozick. To understand libertarianism, it's really helpful to have a good grasp on some central terms. We're going to look at three here. Freedom, or liberty. Equality, or fairness. And luck, or... Luck. Freedom seems like an easy enough concept to define, but it can actually be a little tricky. When we discuss the views of Immanuel Kant in a future episode, we'll note that his understanding of freedom or autonomy is a little bit unique. For Kant, freedom or autonomy means acting in a way that is not dictated by your preferences or desires. You are governed by a self-law. For libertarians, freedom, or liberty, has a slightly different meaning. It tends to refer to having the space to do what you want, provided what you want to do doesn't infringe upon the liberty of another, without the interference of other individuals or entities like the state. But this is only one way of understanding even the term liberty. We can differentiate, for example, between positive liberty and negative liberty. Negative liberty refers to that type of non-interference we just described. It's the way libertarians tend to view liberty. You have negative liberty if you can make a choice without coercion from another. According to this view of liberty, you are only free if you have the ability and opportunity to make a choice that you desire to make. In this sense, non-interference isn't enough to ensure that someone has positive liberty. Even if no one coerces you, if you don't have the opportunity to get food or water, you are not free to live a healthy life. Because libertarians focus on the notion of negative liberty, they tend to emphasize the notion of non-interference, including from the state. And for the libertarians of the minimal state persuasion, and really most libertarians, the state has no role in promoting the positive liberty of its individual citizens. In fact, if the state collects taxes in order to redistribute wealth and ensure that other people have equal opportunities, it commits a crime against the negative liberty of those citizens from whom it collects the taxes. If you've ever heard the expression, taxation is theft, this is kind of the idea that's at work. The state cannot co-opt the private property of one citizen to give it to another citizen, even if they're just trying to ensure equal positive liberty. They can't do it because it's a violation of negative liberty to take someone's property. In future episodes, we're going to discuss other forms of justice, for example, that of the political philosopher John Rawls, who emphasized that the state has an important role in promoting positive liberty. Another important term is equality or fairness. One caricature of libertarians is that they don't care about equality or fairness. This is a caricature because it depends on what we mean by the terms equality and fairness. When we say equality, for example, do we mean equal outcome or equal opportunity? And even if we agree on equal opportunity, what equal opportunity looks like will be different depending on whether we emphasize negative liberty or positive liberty. Libertarians reject the idea that a just society Society will lead to equal outcomes for its citizens. In fact, they tend to embrace the idea that a just society will lead to inequalities. However, they do argue that a just society must have equal opportunities. But by equal opportunities, they simply mean that its citizens should have equal negative liberty. For instance, when they acquire or transfer property. But an important question rises here. How do we know if everyone has equal negative liberty? To answer this deceptively controversial question, it's important to consider another term, 
Luck. For our purposes, luck refers to all the aspects of your situation that you didn't cause or choose through intentional efforts. For example, you didn't choose who your parents would be. You didn't choose your genetic code. You didn't choose when and where you were born. These are all aspects of luck. To understand the way that libertarians tend to think about luck, it's helpful to draw on the work of John Rawls, who categorizes luck into two lotteries, the natural lottery and the social lottery. The natural lottery refers to all the biological features and potentialities that you're born with. For example, some people people naturally have a much greater propensity for athleticism or critical thinking. Some people are born very healthy, while others are born with extreme health issues. These conditions have an immense impact on your life, but you didn't do anything to choose them. You haven't earned the gifts that you were given at birth, nor do you deserve the detriments that you were given at birth. It's just random. For most libertarians, no one has any responsibility to even the playing field when it comes to the natural lottery. The social lottery is different though. The social lottery refers to the political, social, and economic situation you're born into. For example, if you were born a woman in the early 1800s, you wouldn't have a right to vote. The fact that you were born a woman is part of the natural lottery. But the fact that you were born into a society that doesn't allow women to vote is part of the social lottery. Libertarians such as Nozick accept that if the social lottery has been detrimental to someone's negative liberty, the state actually can have a role in trying to equal that playing field. And the reason is that if the social lottery dictates that some people don't have equal negative liberty, the acquisition and transfer of properties in that society isn't just. Having briefly looked at some key terms that help us to understand libertarianism, let's look at some common themes that are shared among libertarians and are especially important to minimal state libertarians. Carl, do you think I'm saying the word libertarian enough? I feel like I'm not quite doing it. I sound like one of those people praying to God and saying the word Father God over and over again. We've already noted the importance of negative liberty. Included in this emphasis on negative liberty is a strong sense of property rights. There tend to be two forms of property rights in libertarianism. First, you own yourself. Therefore, no one can dictate what you can or cannot do with your own body, provided that you're not infringing upon the liberty of another. Second, you own the property that you acquire justly. If I earn my property through just work, no one, even the state, has the right to take it away from me. Again, this is where we get the notion that taxation is theft. In fact, some libertarians, such as Nozick, have gone beyond this notion, suggesting that taxation is not merely theft, but a form of enslavement. So how do we ensure that people acquire and transfer property justly? Well, libertarians tend to say that the best way to do this is by a free market. In this view, the value of things is determined by the aggregate decisions of millions and millions of participants in the market. This aggregate constitutes an invisible hand that dictates the price of things, but also tends to put things in the hands of people who will make the most use of them. As already noted, the emphasis on negative liberty also tends to entail a very limited role of government. Minimal state libertarians tend to maintain that the state should not intervene in economic affairs, for instance, by regulating businesses, requiring a minimum wage, or by redistributing wealth. But libertarians also tend to maintain that the state should be limited when it comes to social issues, including laws about drugs, prostitution, abortion, homosexuality, and immigration. Some people find it helpful to think of libertarians as economically conservative and socially liberal. While there's some truth to this idea, we don't want to push it too far. Libertarians might approve or disapprove of homosexuality, prostitution, or abortion. They might think those things are immoral. They just don't think the state should have a role in making those decisions for people. In other words, the state shouldn't legislate morality. Let's take a few moments to consider why people are drawn to libertarianism. There is certainly an appeal to the idea that I own myself, or at the very least, that I can't be coerced against my will to do certain things with my body. It's also appealing to think that my property is my own if I work justly to acquire it, and so no one can tell me what to do with it. I am free to buy, sell, and trade with other free individuals as we both see fit, provided we are not interfering with the freedom of other individuals. That's an appealing idea. So given these appealing aspects of libertarianism, why do some people reject it? Let's take a look at some common criticisms. First, while the concept of self-ownership is appealing, it does raise some issues. First, if self-ownership is so sacrosanct that we can't do anything to violate the negative liberty of another, it would seem that we can't cause even the slightest inconvenience to negative liberty, even if it would mean securing the welfare of a lot of people. We can't hold someone still for even a moment, even if it would save lives. Or we can't force people to wear masks even in the middle of a pandemic. But if we allow these exceptions by saying that, well, self-ownership isn't that sacrosanct, then we have to figure out where we draw the line between what the state can force the self to do and what the state can't force the self to do. And that can be tricky. Self-ownership can raise another issue. If people are free to do whatever they want with their bodies, they can do ridiculously harmful things to their own bodies. Sandel raises the story of one man who allowed another man to kill and eat him. If we own ourselves, Aren't we allowed to allow ourselves to be killed by others and consumed by them? In other words, if we take libertarianism to its logical conclusion, 
Why can't people engage in voluntary cannibalism? Second, libertarianism doesn't have any safeguards against the randomness of luck, especially with regard to the natural lottery. People who win the natural lottery will just have easier lives. And that's okay for most libertarians. But if some people have easier lives than others, can we really say that they deserve or they merit all the property that they acquire? Furthermore, those who are born with chronic health issues can't demand that anyone help them, even if that help would save their lives. According to libertarianism, we only have one obligation to one another, and that's to respect each other's negative liberty. But given how harsh the natural lottery can be, it seems intuitively problematic to suggest that we can all collectively turn our backs on someone who has a chronic health issue and consider that just. This is where the issue with positive liberty comes into play. One could argue that the at times radical inequalities that occur from the natural lottery deserve some focus or attention from the state. This idea is all the more poignant when we consider that libertarians like Nozick accept that libertarianism will in fact lead to inequalities, sometimes radical inequalities. Third, Nozick maintains that an unjust acquisition or transfer of property could merit reparations from the state. This point seems quite significant in the United States, but a lot of libertarians don't seem to notice it. For example, the coercive nature of some treaties that early Americans made with Native Americans doesn't quite meet the criteria of just acquisition of property. And the breaking of those treaties is certainly unjust. Another example is the history of slavery and segregation in America. According to a 2019 survey of consumer finances, the median household wealth of black families in the United States is about 15% of the median household wealth of white families. While the causes of this disparity are no doubt complex, Part of it goes back to practices such as redlining, which effectively separated black neighborhoods from white neighborhoods. This practice often led to inequalities because the home equity of white neighborhood houses tended to increase much faster than the home equity of black neighborhood houses. That means if a black family and a white family both made equal investments in a house, they would now have a great disparity in terms of household wealth because one house would be worth a lot more than the other. This history appears to be unjust by libertarian standards. And yet, most libertarians are opposed to the notion of the redistribution of wealth. For example, in the United States, the Libertarian Party platform states, all efforts by government to redistribute wealth or to control or manage trade are improper in a free society. We support any initiative to reduce or abolish any tax and oppose any increase or any tax for any reason. The problem is that such a position doesn't seem to acknowledge the residual effects of past injustices. Fourth, libertarians tend to embrace a free market, but there is some question as to how free a free market actually is. We're going to explore this idea in our next episode, so I'll leave it there for now. One final criticism of libertarianism is it doesn't do justice to the radical interconnectedness of reality. The natural sciences have helped us to understand how interconnected all reality is. The actions of one creature or one species can radically affect the outcome of other creatures or other species. Human beings are no different. The actions of one individual or group will reverberate in the intricate web of relationships with others. In such a world, it may be myopic to focus solely on negative liberty. In this episode, we explored libertarianism. We highlighted the variety of forms of libertarianism, but we focused on minimal state libertarianism. We considered some central terms and common themes to this approach to justice. We also provided a brief evaluation of libertarianism. In our next episode, we're gonna take a look at how different approaches to justice envision what a just market might look like. Until then, Farewell.